Hey, this is Phil Better from the podcast, Invest in Yourself, the Digital Entrepreneur's Podcast. Have you ever wanted to be an entrepreneur? Have you heard about all those kids making money on the internet? Do you want to start making money on the internet? Go to investinyourselfpod.com, subscribe, and listen as I interview people who have actually made money online. Listen to me, create a business, and see if I can succeed. Catch new episodes every Tuesday at investinyourselfpod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me is my co-host, and thankfully for this episode, our official radical 18th century feminist, Mackenzie. Can I can I say that? Can, I can say I can say I'm a feminist, obviously, which I am. But can I say that I'm like I'm I, I can't say I'm an authority, can I? Though I, I think it would be stretching it a bit. I mean, I, I don't want to be there claiming that I understand the the trials and tribulations of being a woman. Right, exactly. And it's it's kind of interesting, like totally off topic, immediately <laughs> off the bat. But I know, like, even guys as feminists is sometimes of a contentious topic. Mm-hmm. It's like you can be pro-feminist, but to be a feminist itself and be a guy is a bit uh, dicey sometimes to some people. For sure. I, but, I told I can I get that. Again, yeah. not my sphere to comment on, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm a I'm an active listener in that situation. <laughs> as it was yeah. put in Brooklyn nine nine, I should probably just be an active listener. Totally fair. Before we get too much in the show, just a quick reminder that, you know, the show is supported by listeners like you. I'm taking the PBS angle on this one. If you want to support us, you can check out the Patreon. PBS. Our... <laughs> you can check out our Patreon. You can check out the uh, recommended reading page. All kinds of stuff that we have linked in the description. And of course, we need to give a shout out to our patrons, Elise and Sina Zais. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And if you want to follow along with what we're reading today, you can also check that out below. The book is available for free and legally online. Speaking of PBS, we discussed PBS on our side series, Pop Canada, where we discussed the recently cancelled Canadian television show, Caillou. Amazing segue. Thank you very much for that. (laughs) You can check it out for $3 a month on Patreon. A lot of fun. So, we're going to be talking about a book. It's going to be a much more literary-focused episode than a historically-focused one. So we're actually going to be talking about the very first Canadian novel, according to some people, which was published in 1769 and is called The History of Emily Montague, written by Francis Brooke. That's right. The first novel in Canada was written by a woman. So that's kind of cool. So this whole episode today is going to take us a bit, not only through an analysis of a book, but going to kind of explore what it meant to write as a woman at the time, what were the limitations, what were the possibilities, why it was accept that she say certain things or not, right? And how that impacts the writing of a book in Canada. And then how Canadianism seeps in. And also how, because the form is important with this one. I'm going to say that off the bat. The form is very, this isn't just a novel. This isn't a epistolary novel for those who don't know. So it's a collection of letters presented as a novel. It sort of changes up how things are presented in the focus. Very good point. So just a bit of context. So as I mentioned, the book was written in 1769. So this is kind of a flashback episode, if you will. We're not really within our regular chronology. We're still in the 1830s, people. Exactly. (laughs) Although in the next episodes, we're going to really jump ahead to like the 1850s. Anyway, in 1769, this book comes out and... Politically, Canada is much different than what we're talking about on the regular show, right? Or at least where we're at in the chronology. Mm. Because at this point, the British had just taken over from the French, right? And America hadn't seceded yet from the British Empire. It was a completely different ballgame. I'm mentioning this only because the politics of Canada and the politics of the people running Canada are intrinsically tied to this book. Mm -hmm. Um, So the book is dedicated actually to the governor general of the province of Canada at the time, who was a man by the name of Guy Carleton, who was the first Lord Dorchester. With listeners from Montreal, they'll know that as the name of a street in uh, Westmount. 
it's René Lévesque Street, but the English didn't want to change it to René Lévesque, so it's still Dorchester. <laughs> Westmount. Yep. Just briefly, Carlton himself, if we talk about his politics, was rather an interesting figure, much like his predecessor, uh, John Murray, uh, James Murray, sorry. He actually wanted to take an approach that was a bit more accommodating to the French Canadians that the British had just taken over. So a lot of his politics will reflect that. This idea of trying to not necessarily fully assimilate, although that was eventually a goal, but to at oh. least but to at least say to at least allow for the French Canadians to live pretty well under a British system while slowly adapting to the British norms. Right. It wasn't it wasn't horrible just yet. We we hadn't gotten our our boy. Our boy Lord Durham hadn't showed up yet. <laughs> like Look, Lord Durham like solidified a lot of these, but the ideas don't come from nowhere, obviously. No, <laughs> no obviously not. So, it comes from the usual British plan. Oh, yeah. I, I mention this because, as I say, the book itself, The History of Emily Montague, is dedicated to Guy Carleton, who Francis Brooke, the author, appears to be in favor of. Right? Mm -hmm. But, as we're going to see, her politics and those of her family really don't quite align with Guy Carleton's at all. So I just think it's an interesting thing to bring up right away what Guy Carleton represents before we cover what Francis Brooke, re Brooke represents and see why there's such a disparity there. I think that's pretty much covers like the historical background for, that's for what, now. That's all you really need to know. It's, yeah, that's... it's colonial Quebec, just got conquered by the British. Yep. So all these British people were basically coming over and being like, "Oh wow, look at their look at those their Canadians sitting around. <laughs> look at all the nature." Says Ooh, the worst British accent. <laughs> Ooh, ah. <laughs> I guess it could be important to note also that this is pre-Quebec Act, which solidified a lot of rights of the French Canadians. People were what talking rights? about about giving them but they they hadn't yet been legislated on. So mm -hmm. there was still, it was still open to debate as to whether or not French Canadians would be allowed to continue practicing their religion or speak their language and so on and so forth. Frances Brooke herself is an interesting character. She was born actually Frances Moore in, we think, 1724. At the time, it's kind of sketchy, especially that she wasn't born in a major center she was born just in, she was born in Claypool, which is a much smaller and birth certificates and official records are a bit harder to come by. We estimate that she was born in 1724 to an Anglican family. And most of her life, while she would later be associated with a bit more of a bourgeois mindset, most of her life was lived in poverty. And even as she began her career as a better known and well-recognized woman of letters, mm -hmm. that kind of richness, uh, that, or at least wealth, did not appear much. Right? She kind of walked the walk, but she didn't actually have much to back it up. <laughs> it's kind of... Uh... <laughs> I love how you just sidestepped that one. <laughs> she, 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 she walked the walk, but uh, did she not talk the talk no i decided to to, to subvert it just because i'm that kind of guy god this whole episode is about subverting expectations okay i'm just gonna lean into it <laughs> so she marries a reverend a man by the name of john brooke which is where she gets her uh her name after and not long after she would write and create a magazine or a journal by the name of The Old Maid, which saw its initial publication in 1755. Right? So she's mm -hmm. right around 30 years old and she's starting a weekly periodical under the pseudonym Mary Singleton Spinster. And she had a whole character around who Mary Singleton was. She was an elderly woman. Obviously, she was a virgin. But I think this is a really interesting place to stop already and kind of gives a solid image of who Frances Brooke was and what she represented. Mm -hmm. Because not only did she create this character, right, that was meant to appeal to a wider audience, she wasn't this 
greatly thinking woman. She was an elderly person. She was wise, and especially she was a virgin. She had good moral values. But just in the periodical itself, the old maid is actually very interesting what she does. Um, you can find some versions of the old maid online. There are digitized copies of it. But it's kind of interesting in how it differs from most women-led periodicals of the time, which were mostly concerned with domestic affairs and things that were typically associated with womanhood. How to mm -hmm. cook, how to take care of your household, how to take care of your husband, so on and so forth. How to live a moral uh, life. Frances Brooke decides to take a different approach under this pseudonym, in which she actually tackles wider concerns, right? She talks about international affairs, like an earthquake that happened in Portugal. She talks about going to war with France. She talks about issues with marriage and whether or not it should be consenting, right? That was a huge deal at the time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this comes through in The Old Maid, which we're going to talk about a bit later about women's writing in general in Canada and the British Empire and women's rights. But I think it's important to note right away. And finally, just in capping off this overview of who Frances Brooke was, she would come to Canada in 1763, so just as the British took over. And she would spend a few years there. Depending on who you ask, she either went back to England in 1765 or in 1768. It's a debate that's been going on in academia for some time because apparently people have nothing better to argue about. And... During this time, whether it's two or five years, she would write the history of Emily Montague in Canada. About her character itself, like we'll get a lot of it in the novel and throughout the episode, but just in like overviewing her, I think that's pretty much the major points that we can already talk about. Mm -hmm. I think an important way to begin this discussion about writing in Canada at the time, or even in the British Empire at the time, or just in general, I think, in European circles, uh, is to start with thinking about how women were perceived, how women were allowed to write, and what the conventions that they were playing with were, right? Right. As I mentioned, a lot of the publications that women did produce at the time that Frances Brooke was writing often had to do with domestic affairs. Right? And this really gives insight into what, I guess you could call it feminism was at the time, even though it wouldn't necessarily have had that name. It's certainly an active enabling of women's rights. So feminism in the 18th century is mostly about the limits of public and private life. Where women are often relegated to the domestic sphere, a lot of these more radical, quote-unquote radical, periodicals were concerned with how they could actually act in a public sphere, right? Or how they could go beyond the domestic tasks that they were given by society and yeah. by their husbands and by other women. Well, I mean, this is also like, it, it's the early part of it. So this is only just a little bit before the birth of Jane Austen. Yeah. So we're, that, that sort of tells you what kind of feminism we're looking at right now. Absolutely. Just a couple of years later, there would be Mary Wollstonecraft who would write a really well-known treatise within feminist theory on the rights of women, yep. which you can find also for free online. But it's, it's very much this idea of like, hey, we can do like we should be able to move beyond the household. That's pretty much, if we're, if we're going to sum it up in a sentence, it's pretty much that, as you say, Jay. Hey, Austin if we step outside the house, we don't die. Oh my God. We don't die. And like, we can actually speak <laughs> when we're not spoken to. There's what more to life than providing heirs. <laughs> what? What kind of radical revolutionary idea is that? Yeah. We laugh, we make fun of it, but it's... But that's what it was. <laughs> totally. That's radical for me. In my opinion, that's totally radical. Oh, for and I time. love that. People who hear that and think otherwise, it's you have to understand, you know, this is a different time. So just them starting to think differently is going to be radical in itself. That's what radical really... Radical, being radical is, is doing something different from the norm. And the norm of that time was women stay in house, take care of children. Well, take care of children, I say in air quotes, because they got a nanny most of the time. If you were rich enough, sure. Yeah, if you were rich enough, you'd get a nanny and then go to social events with other women. There was obviously 
differences in other literature you can look at that shows how they move from between private and public but this is this is we're entering the period now where this really starts to change it's interesting that you kind of bring about this idea of change right and or at least rich <clears throat> enough to to be able to afford certain things because right around this time you also do see despite there being a lot of talk about what women can do within society, it also kind of coincides with an increasing distinguishing between higher and lower classes. Right. And a lot of this discussion on feminism and what it means to be a woman is very much reserved, or at least it's framed within a bourgeois circle. Now we think of bourgeois today of like bourgeois versus proletariat kind of thing, but I, I do genuinely mean it in a, in like a bourgeois sense of more of an aristocratic. Yeah, the traditional aspect. one, the traditional yes. meaning for it. And there's kind of a distance that's created here um, that's especially visible in Europe. And I bring it up because as Francis Brooke moves to Canada, a lot of these barriers get kind of muddied, right? So it is something that I think we need to mention before bringing it up fully, maybe. Mm -hmm. There's a few things that I want to mention just in passing two things. So religion and the perception of women writers themselves. So I mentioned at the start of the episode that Frances Brooke was an Anglican, right? She was raised in an Anglican family, which is a branch of Protestantism. Okay. Now we tend to think today of religion as kind of a very conservative uh, circle. It takes some time for it to actually change. But at the time, there is something to say about the fact that she is a Protestant in that a lot of the Protestant sects or groups were considered a bit more progressive than, for example, Catholics, right? Which were like the, the conservative branch of, of religion, right? Of Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is important to mention. I think this is one of the reasons why she was able to write what she wrote in things like The Old Maid is because her Protestantism allowed for some leeway. I don't know what you know about, like what you, if you have any thoughts about religion, Mackenzie or its ability to provide freedom or not. But from what None. I understood of religion at the time, that's pretty much a possibility for her because of Protestantism, even though it's not great nonetheless. I mean, no thoughts on religion, religion that would be productive to the conversation. But right. you, you are right in the fact that the discussion between the difference of Protestantism and Catholicism is always an interesting one to have, especially because the foundation of Protestantism was... I want to have a divorce. <laughs> King Henry being their King Henry, the divorce person, you know, and that was so. The, it's based on fully on the idea of finding a different way or finding some sort of way of freedom. Absolutely, and you can see it. For example, if we take a, a North American focus, well, that is a bit of a contentious topic, like East, uh, about how exactly they promoted that freedom. But a lot of Protestants came, for example, to the United States and promoted, even though they didn't always put it into practice, but promoted a lot of these more progressive ideals of society. Yep. Right? Whereas if you look at how, for example, Catholicism or mostly Catholic settlers evolved or developed here in Quebec, it was a very long time before they kind of reached the same status of equality and progressiveness that they would see in the rest of North America. <laughs> right? The Catholic Church was a very, very powerful force of conservatism. Right. Now, in a more secular age, we tend to look at just Christianity and religion in general as a conservative force, but I think at the time, this is an important distinction to make. Again, this is colonial-ish America, so religion is always going to be an important thing to take a look at. Now, last thing I want to mention is portrayals and perceptions of women, right? And especially portrayals of perceptions of women between the so-called old world, right? Europe and the new world, North America, or the Americas in general. <laughs> so I'll link this in the description, but there are two images that we're gonna, that we can at least talk about vaguely. One of them is from a painter born here, right? Who's uh, from a, sorry, one of them is from a writer a woman writer who was born here named Sarah Solomon. And another one is a painting of Francis Brooke, who, as we just established, was born in England and came to Canada. Right? So the links are in the description. You can look alongside with us, but I don't know if you looked at these pictures before the show, Mac. 
I did. I think there's some interesting things to talk about in the ways in which the women are kind of portrayed. Right? Definitely a difference to look at in the sense of proprietary. Propriety? Propriety? Yeah. Propriety. So <laughs> if we look at the Sarah Solomon one, how would you describe her allure? How would you describe how she's portrayed right, as a writer? It's very proper, very postures upright. She's got the nice clothes. She doesn't, she's like, it's a very half smile situation. Mm -hmm. For those who can't see it, she's got a book in hand. Very much she's trying to appear dignity in class. Yeah. The book is not the central focus of the image here. This is not what the point of the picture is. Yes, she was a writer and it's kind of, and a lot of times books and paintings were supposed to represent education, but it's not the central focus. It's kind of in the corner in a bit of a dark uh, part of the painting. Yes, you see it in hand, but it's kind of floppily placed there. It almost seems like a second thought. If we compare that to the image of Frances Brooke, how would you go about that one? She's a bit more relaxed. Her, She's got her head resting on her hand. Again, she's got the similar half smile, but she seems more relaxed in her features while she's doing it. She's got a bit of a slouch to her posture. The book is a lot more haphazardly placed indicating overall that this is sort of a more informal picture yeah it's a bit more informal it's a bit of a looser idea of what of, of womanhood right you don't have to be prim and proper and no but you, 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 you no no no, no, no i'm not laughing at that i'm laughing at like because it's in the colonies fucking <laughs> dirty colonials i don't know where this painting itself was no it probably wasn't I, I don't know. The the former one, the one we, the Sarah Solomon one, was painted in the colonies. Ah. I think the Francis Brooke one was made in Europe. I think it was made after she was, uh, she came back. Uh, 30 Europeans then. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does kind of show this, um, this disparity between uh, perceptions, right? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, in a bit more of a progressive oriented Europe, you have this woman who's who's pretty much over over her book right it's a bigger book she is shown as a bit more easygoing i guess or at least that's the image i i perceive in seeing it no for sure and whereas in the colonies even though it was around the same time that this painting was made they still had this very formal idea of not only art but just what women should look like and act like i also think there's part of it is there's a need, there's a tendency to overcompensate for formality in the colonies just be so that they can push back against the fact that they're a colony in nature, surrounded by, as they are called at the time, not what I agree with, they're surrounded by the savages. Yeah, oh yeah. So there's this tendency to want to overcompensate on how formality is portrayed so that they can keep up this. They don't have to, Brit, Britain in Britain doesn't have to fight up with the image of formality because they are the mother country. The colonies do. Anything else you wanted to mention about portrayals of women or, or just Francis Brooke in general or womanhood <laughs> no. as the radical feminist of the pod I think it's your right to totally say your mind about things like this I'm, I am pro-feminist I think it's the safer thing to say yeah yeah I don't have anything to add I don't think I okay. think I think it is a fascinating fact that what we consider the first Canadian novel is a female piece of writing mm-hmm if you constantly, what there was an old document and it was, I think it was in the 1920s and it was a bunch of people when they were trying to decide what the Canadian canon was. And when they were making their list to the side, they released this sort of like document sort of talking about what they believed it was. And it totally like, it was like overgeneralizing, but no women writers, no writers of First Nation, blah, blah, blah. And you look at what we talk about today, the first Canadian novel is a female writer. The most well-known Canadian author in the world is also female. I mean, I, I won't speak to the character of Margaret Atwood, but I, you can't deny the popularity of Margaret Atwood. No, absolutely not. Say what you will about how you know things still suck. There has definitely been some progress in that respect. I mean, I'm, I don't know if we're going to be the should be the ones to comment and say there's progress. I just find it's an interesting thing to look at in comparison from then to now. I think there's. I think it's fair to say there's been progress at least in. Oh, it, look, it's better. I wouldn't. I, I don't think there are a lot of women that would say that they would prefer to live 
1768 as they would in 2021. I don't know anybody who would prefer to live in 1768. Right, but that's my point. Right? I don't think it's like that much of a hot take to say that by and large for women, it kind of has gotten better. There's still yeah. a whole lot to deal with. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's, I think it's very safe to say that it's somewhat better. I, I was just pointing out the interesting yes. part of the Canadian canon that has this strong feminist tilt to it. I guess, or I guess yeah. like what is popular, what we look at. This is the first Canadian novel. Margaret Atwood is the most popular. A lot of the First Nation stories I have read, all written by, again, that might, that might be a byproduct of a lot of uh, female professors and educators in my time mm -hmm. who decided to, to thankfully show me this stuff, but I just find it's kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it is interesting that you bring that up though, that bite exactly what we were just talking about, right? This conservatism or this formalism if you will that is shown in women at the time in the colonies right for the reasons that you mentioned mm -hmm. that we would still demonstrate this a bit um, a bit more of this progress as you say with margaret atwood margaret lawrence is another really good example in the 60s uh francis brooke if we want to keep going on what we're saying so there's simultaneously this resistance to what women can do in the colonies and yet allows for this ability for women to express themselves in a very popular way right right yeah i don't know where i was going with it i don't have an answer necessarily to why that happens but <laughs> <laughs> not because I, I i haven't studied the question per se but i think it's a very interesting point to raise Now, if we finally get to the novel. Yes, the novel. As you mentioned, Mackenzie, it's an epistolary novel, which means it's composed of a variety of letters, right, that characters send to one another. There is a story to the history of Emily Montague, but it's not necessarily as we would imagine it in a straightforward novel where A, B, and C happens, right? A lot of it is based off of what characters say to one another, and we kind of fill in some of the blanks. It's a lot of you're reading between the lines in this situation of what's going on. Yeah, but broadly speaking, the novel itself can be summarized as Ed Rivers, who's the chief male character of the book. If you want to know what Ed Brooks is like, he's a bro. If he was alive today, he'd be in a fraternity. He'd be the kind of toxic figure in that fraternity. <laughs> God. For the time, I guess he was all right because... Ed Rivers is trying to court Emily Montague. Who who's is, engaged. Exactly, right? Who's engaged to someone who's not in the colonies. But Emily Montague arrives in Quebec. She arrives in Quebec in June 1766. And Ed Rivers is immediately interested in courting her and marrying her. Parallel to that, we get a second love story, which is uh, about Arabella Firmer, Firmer, sorry, Arabella Firmer, Firmer, who also just kind of gallivants with a bunch of different male characters, right? And we understand that mostly through Arabella's uh, letters to uh, Emily Montague, right? Oh, okay, this certain character is interesting. This male figure, oh, he's so drab. That's the kind of character that Arabella is. That's, that's what we want to hear. Woohoo! For the time, I guess so, because the book was pretty popular. At least it was yeah. in England. It didn't That's... really sell much in Canada, ironically. But for the time, I guess that is what people wanted to see. As part of its low status, it was popular. Yeah, definitely. If a book is low, people don't listen to that. People thought Shakespeare was lowbrow. People thought Charles Dickens was lowbrow at the time. So like, low and high status for literature means nothing. It means something for the time it's in. But not, not to history. No. The letters themselves are interesting not only because it shows a lot of the relations between women and men or women between themselves at the time, but they also provide some of the more detailed descriptions of Canada at the time, right? Especially in the nature and the Quebecois people or the French Canadians and even Native Americans, right? All of these are described 
as characters send letters to one another Mm -hmm. and as characters compare, for example, the French Canadians to nature or natives to noble savages, as the old saying goes, right? So it does have more depth than simply a love story between four or five or six characters. (laughs) Well, I mean, Montague herself, I believe, only starts appearing in letter eight, I think it is, somewhere around letter seven to eight. Still, though, the first five letters is a lot of description by Ed Rivers about what he sees, what Canadian wilderness looks like. Mm -hmm. A lot of, again, Quebec plays a big part of it. There's paragraphs just describing uh, the Hotel Dieu, the General Hospital. The convents. The First Nations people are talked about, and it's so pretty. There's a, God. Anyway, the love story is second to what is mostly talking about Canada. When it, or even when it does show up, I think the natural elements that are strongly associated with Canada still play a great part in it, Mm -hmm. which... We can get into a bit later, but just to to open us up to this discussion of the history of Emily Montague, what did you think of the book? Like, what stood out to you as particularly interesting? I actually really like the descriptions. Again, we're we're in the romantic period, so the descriptions are actually absolutely beautiful, especially in regards to how Canada is described. And within the second letter itself, like there's this wonderful little line and it goes, the country is a very fine one. You see here, not only the beautiful, which has, which it has in common with Europe, but the great sublime to an amazing degree. And I find that's a very interesting distinction to make, you know, especially in regards to how there's a shift, you know, there's a difference between what is beautiful, what is pretty, what is the sublime, which is an important discussion I think to have. Absolutely. How would you describe the differences? Oh God. (laughs) If you... Like, okay, or just at least focus on the sublime. Like, what do you mean for for that? So for those who don't, the sublime is something that's hard to talk about. It's like if you're standing on top of a mountain or you're looking at a great big something. You're looking at a great big landscape somewhere. You might not necessarily say it's beautiful, but the feeling it inspires in you is the sublime. It's closer to what the sublime is. Yeah. It's like if you're standing at like a giant Mount Everest is not beautiful, but when you're looking at it and you feel that sense of awe and wonder and splendor, that's the sublime. I would add something else to that. And if, for example, uh, this is something that philosophers like Walter Benjamin will bring up when talking about works of art, right? There's an aura to certain things, right? That kind of emanate onto you and really make you react in ways that go get you deep inside your soul that, that, yeah that that part that speaks to that thing inside of you you know right which i think yeah as you say is a fascinating way of describing canada because as we've seen for a lot of the literature in the show canada is often described less in that sense of sublimation or of the sublime rather and more in just like there's a lot of it's impressive but good lord is this going to take some work there's a lot of fucking trees out here, bud. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, speaking of a lot of trees, right? Going off of what you were saying, there's a really interesting passage that people often quote in this book, but for the life of me, this one baffles me. And it kind of goes off of what you were saying about the landscape and what Canada looks like, where it says, the road from Quebec to Montreal is almost a continued street. The villages being numerous and so extended along the banks of the River St. Lawrence as to leave scarce a space without houses in view, except where here or there a river, wood, or mountain intervenes, as if to give a more pleasing variety to the scene. I have no idea what (laughs) road between Quebec and Montreal she's talking about. There is a continued street, but... The villages aren't that numerous that you don't that you have difficulty seeing space between the houses. Like I have, especially not in the 18th century, and this is in 2021. I have no idea what she's talking about. She hasn't like properly been on a trip between the two. I don't think so. Wait, is she saying that there's no houses except where there isn't? <laughs> but that there's also a lot of houses. There's a lot of houses except where there isn't a lot of houses. That, that, that whole sentence really, really got to me. It, it shows to me two things. One, she, is, she does kind of hit the nail on the head with 
the vast of the vastness of Canada, right? And kind of the this how spread out it is, mm-hmm. uh, how a lot of the settlers instead of focusing in on what we now understand as metropolises such as Montreal and Quebec, they did certainly spread out and use a lot of the space that was available to them. But it also kind of shows. I think how little she actually traveled within Canada, because I I, I think a lot of what she's basing herself on is secondhand accounts or what uh, other people. Yeah, exactly. Secondhand (laughs) accounts, like what other people told her, what her husband might have told her. Oh, this is a hundred percent. Are we not going to talk about the part in like the opening where the opening letters where there's the story of the Indian who cuts off and feeds an English prisoner's arm to her children? Okay, yes, go for it. Yo, like he has this whole letter where he's talking about his interactions with the First Nations peoples. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is talking about, of course, the shape of the Indian woman, how shapely they are, how how they are... Hold on, it's they're so pretty before they get married. Yeah. And, okay, so listen to this. A Jesuit missionary told me a story of on this subject, what, which one cannot hear without horror. An Indian woman with whom he lived on his mission was feeding her children when her husband brought in an English prisoner. She immediately cut off his arm and gave her children the streaming blood to drink. The Jesuit remonstrated on the cruelty of the action on which, looking sternly at him, I would have them warriors, said she, and therefore feed them with the food of men. Yeah, she clearly never met a Native American person in her life. Or she never met, like, an actual... I can see a Jesuit missionary, like, reporting this. I also, like, uh, the English w- prisoner is, of course, a warrior, fit enough to feed the blood, of, obviously. Like, yes. this is such a beautifully disgusting little couple of sentences to say the English are both warriors and the savages are disgusting. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we can just segue into the differences between European aristocracy and the native populations. It's kind of fascinating because there's the, there, the, there are places like what you just mentioned that it's horrifyingly disgusting, mm-hmm. right? The, this idea um, of Native American populations as cannibals, while there are accounts of cannibalism, their the veracity is kind of tenuous there. at best. Um, but like to, to have this be presented in the way that she's presenting it as a fit of e- uh, 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 a complete factual account is a bit weird. It's very sure. weird, actually. However, and this kind of comes back also to Francis Brooks' more feminist ideas, they don't shy away from, tel- uh, from telling us when the First Nations actually do something that's better than Europeans. Right? Okay. Um, so if you look at letter 11, it's a whole section about how... Th- the First Nations societies, in this case, she's specifically talking about the Hurons, are much more egalitarian than what we find in Europe. Mm. And especially, and she brings a point to this, is that women have voting rights on the councils. And that's something that very much fascinates Francis Brooke, who is writing through the character of Ed Rivers here. Oh, for sure. There's definitely that, that part of it, that the feminist part of it, again, sort of the opportunities for women in other cultures more than anything else. Mm-hmm. But again, it's kind of framed in this way. I, I, I hate to be like a negative person and things like that. It's very much framed in this way, nevertheless, as, well, you see this, again, her words, not mine, this more primitive culture is doing things that we should be doing, right? Mm-hmm. Why are they so advanced in this respect when everything else that they're doing is kind of not, right? And is I can respect, cannibalistic. I can respect the balls on that statement, just, or the... The chutzpah, that statement, just because of the fact that it's so easy to turn that statement around and say these people are so back. Look, they're so backwards, they give woman the power, whereas she is actively bringing yeah. this up as if to say, no, 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 this is something they do better than us. Yeah, I agree. It's it's interesting that she does bring it up. Kudos to her. Yeah, I love the, the same letter. Where I speak of their paintings, I should not admit that, though extremely rude, they have a strong resemblance to the Chinese. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, their dance is also the most lively pantomimes I ever saw, and especially in the Dance of Peace exhibit varieties of attitudes resembling figures on Chinese fans. Well, this kind of represents something else also, right? Um, oh, yeah, total ignorance. But ignorance, but 
a, a lot of what permeates this novel is an enlightenment thought. I guess you can put it that way, right? Or at least this rhetoric of what is morally better or socially better between Europe and the colonies or the new world, right? And this kind of passage to me very much encapsulates the limits of this enlightenment thought. Right? And we can talk about more about how, it's, how else it's portrayed, especially between the relations of the Canadiens, the French Canadians, and mm -hmm. the English colonizers. But I, I think this kind of passage that you just read very much represents the limits of enlightenment insofar as ultimately <clears throat> in framing things as a very linear structure towards progress, you're ultimately just promoting imperialism, right? You're promoting a lack of progress because you're just very categorically putting these people into boxes that ha they have no place being into. Right? Well, it's also just part of what travel literature is. Yeah. So it's travel literature, like this is the sort of idea of where you want to make comparisons. That's the basis. That's how a lot of time travel literature tries to explain these phenomena that would not be understandable to a European audience. They try and use something that to give form and present an idea in somebody's head. So again, using something like Chinese to explain it, describing First Nations people as looking Chinese is their version of trying to make sense of something that they do not know that needs to be explained. Yes. It's Going on, uh, do you have anything else to add to the specifically to the First Nations? Um, I do not believe so. I'm trying to remember, I just remember that one line really sticking out to me. You know? Yeah, but I, I agree. But I'm just asking because they all kind of look that way. <laughs> like there, there's very little to to add to the discussion of how the First Nations are depicted here, aside from the noble savage trope and blatant racism. Yeah. I think it's a bit more interesting to see how uh, this kind of conversation leads into the differences between French and English, which it's, they spend a lot more time on in this book and kind of brings us back to this idea of how the novel fits in with the change of government under Guy Carleton right. that I mentioned at the top of the episode. So did you notice, at least uh, in the letters that you read, I know you didn't read all of it, but like, did you notice how they were often compared? The First Nations? The French and the English, sorry. I remember seeing it, but I'm drawing a blank right now. The way I read a lot of it was, the, surprisingly, like the, the French Canadians are often depicted in similar ways, actually, as a lot of the uh, First Nations. Mm. In so far, they're depicted as being closer in body and spirit to the demands of the places and are often very closely related in through description and through the dialogue that characters have with one another with nature, right? They're depicted right. almost as this force of nature, right? That's fit for this kind of a rough and tumble place that is the colony of the province of Quebec at the time. Well, I mean, I just found one passage in letter six. Yeah. The peasants are ignorant, lazy, dirty, and stupid beyond all belief. But hospitable, courteous, civil, and what is particularly agreeable, they leave their wives and daughters to do the honors of the house, in which obliging office they acquit themselves with an attention which, amidst every inconvenient appearance, though I'm told not real poverty can cause much, please every guest who has a soul inclined to be pleased. For my part, I was charmed with them, and eat my homely fare with as much pleasure as if I had been feasting on Ortolans in a palace. Their conversation is lively and amusing. All the little knowledge of Canada is confined to the sex. Very few, even of the seigneurs, being able to write their own names. Yeah. So th he's basically saying, they're hard workers, but they're fucking stupid. Yeah, exactly. That You're immediately right. You said this was letter six. I think this is part of how Francis Brooke immediately sets the scene for how this book very much promotes and tries to justify British assimilation of French Canadians throughout the book, right? She goes about it in different ways, but I think that's a major part of the book is through exactly rhetorics like that, right? mm. which is a bit why I brought up Guy Carleton at the start of the, uh, at the start of the episode, because Francis Brooke will write through characters like you just quoted Ed Rivers, right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll write through characters like that. Words that display the, the lack of sensibility of the French comedians, the lack of intelligence, their 
worthy of this place. Like the, the, it's nice that they actually were able to survive and it shows a certain determination and force of character that they were able to, but they need people like us, like the proper British <laughs> to, no, that, that's it, right? You laugh, I know, I know. but like to show them how to get better at it, right? To develop more. And you can extend that to the First Nations a bit, although it's not as clear cut as when she talks about the French in this case. Mm -hmm. So for example, like, this is in letter one, 169. Just to tell you how many letters there are, people. Yeah, there's a lot. There's something like um... 200 letters in this. It was published in four volumes. <laughs> Jesus. Did you read all of this? Uh, I read a big part of it here and there, but I got the point at some point. <laughs> I mean, I read 11 and I got the point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had a bit more time, I guess. <laughs> That's, that's, we'll get to later when we talk about form, but that's one of the things with epistolarian forms. You, you kind of pick up on the, the meaning kind of quickly, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of talking around just because it's a letter. So like, if you want to do it properly, most letters don't go, oh, hey, I'm, I'm w immediately with, I'm this girl, uh, Emily Montague, blah, 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 blah. Like right. letters, you take your time, you dance around the subject a bit, it makes it a dialogue. And plus, you're a writer. You kind of want to flex a bit, though, <laughs> those nice sentences. Yeah, and you get, you know, you get paid by word or by volume or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the, the passage I was mentioning is at the bottom of letter 169, where it says, We have no Chaudière, no Montmorency, which are a mountain and a waterfall near Quebec. Uh -huh. None of those magnificent scenes on which Canadians have a right to pride themselves. But we excel them in, lovely, in the lovely, the smiling, in enameled meadows, in waving cornfields, in gardens, the boast of Europe, in every elegant art which adorns and softens human life, in all the riches and beauty which cultivation can give. To me, this kind of like symbolizes everything we've been saying so far. They have pretty nature, but we're more cultured. Yeah, exactly. Or what culture they do have is very much in line with everything that they're dealing with. The culture they do have, they didn't actually make. It's just like what's there. Yes. Whereas yeah. we, we as a people are lovely, smiling. We have made cornfields and great be beautiful gardens. Mm-hmm. Um, Kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, all this to say, like the the point for Brooke of the British is to impose a better lifestyle and a better mentality than was previously established under the French regime, right? Social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. Yep. Or you know, in this case, she also points to the need to impose a national religion, which obviously is Anglicanism, because why wouldn't it be if she is herself an Anglican? <laughs> but, <laughs> It's all these things that um, that definitely permeate throughout. I mean, I think we should have a national religion, and like, I'm just saying, I already got one, you know. It's it's ready made, right? And there aren't that many French Canadians. There's only what twelve thousand here at this point. It'll mm -hmm. be easy to give them their own national religion. <laughs> Bringing this back to Governor Carleton, right? This kind of clashes with what we were saying about him earlier. I find, despite it, this novel being dedicated to him <laughs> it it seems like she doesn't really e either she's unaware or she chooses to ignore the fact that he's not really on board with many of the ideas that she's promoting here you know as we mentioned eventually carlton would bring about the quebec act which would secure french rights of religion and french rights of language and even certain forms of government right and laws so there's a disconnect for me here between how she writes about the place where she is and how she Im and how it actually existed. Right? I don't know. I guess my question would be why? <laughs> like, would you, do you think it's because what she's hearing is just in such like a, an echo chamber of British aristocrats and merchants that don't want to accept the change? Or is she trying to instill change, I guess, through this book? before it actually is legitimized through the Quebec Act? I mean, I, I'm not expecting an answer. I'm just saying, like, why would you even do something like that, despite all proof to the contrary? Why would you, what, compare the French and the English, or...? Like, why would you actively go against 
what's already being established as contrary to everything you're writing, right? It's, it's kind of interesting to me. I don't know. Sometimes the act of being contrary is just something we want to do by nature. Right. You know, as human beings, I can't count how many things I've done just despite somebody telling me I can't. Or just, you, you shouldn't do that. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah, exactly. And there's just, I think that that might be like a small part of it, mm -hmm. but more to the other point of it. It's also just, again, part of the enlightenment, the ideals of the enlightenment is everything is discussion and debate and reasoning. Therefore, somebody always has to feel like they have to take the opposite side in that argument. They have to present, therefore, they can have true reasoning and enlightenment available to them. Yeah, I think another part, this is something that I forget which article I read about. There, there's a lot of questioning about where information comes from. Mm -hmm. right? And this is permeated in the novel itself. Right? A lot of, we, we don't know where, for example, the information about the cannibal, uh, like the, 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 where we know that the information about the cannibal First Nations came from a Jesuit. So a lot of it is secondary or third sources or people just interacting with one another, right? right. Information has a lot of time to distort itself at this time. And kind of going off of that, um, one of the authors that I read that was criticizing the novel or taking a more critical approach to it was saying, you know, a lot of this uh, for a lot of this was the case of a lot of women writers at the time is that sometimes it's debatable about where they got their information was it just from peers right other women that they were writing letters to were they just receiving information from their husbands right were they critically thinking right often it's a mix of all three of these things right but it does cast a light of questioning onto you know the 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 relevance of the information that they have at their disposal, especially in cases like this. So for example, like her husband was a reverend in Quebec City, right? Who was very much pro-national church as well. And very much within this circle of people who would benefit from having an English hegemony everywhere. Right? Right. So a lot of these ideas, I'm not saying that she couldn't think on her own, obviously not. But a lot of these ideas might also come from people like... Uh, men in power that that did uh, influence that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of this is speculation because we know very little about what she did in Canada right, or who she talked to. She didn't obviously write everything down, but it's. I, I do think it is something to take into account when we think about women writers at the time. Right. And again, as a since she's a woman writer, we're lucky to know as much as we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Just speaking to the form. I find yes, this very interesting, it. the epistolarian forms. And so it's it's often a tool that is used, I find, in these types of stories that are about telling journeys. Like a lot of travel literature uses ideas. They use journals, travel logs, letters, reports, things of that nature as sort of a supplementary, secondary source to provide their narrative. The yep. big example would be uh, the book Dracula by Bram Stoker. <laughs> Yeah, just, totally. Just, just to just to bring in a weird connection as I do, as I like to do. <laughs> no, but go ahead. Explain like further what you mean by that. The use of letters itself. Again, as we see here, this is a long four volume book, whereas the actual plot could probably happen a lot quicker. Again, we were talking a bit beforehand where the plot of this novel is essentially a Netflix teen drama. <laughs> yep. Like city boy goes to countryside meets country girl who has confidence issues, falls in love, and they get married. Mm -hmm. There's a subplot with a, with a flirtatious, funny, sarcastic best friend. There's a lot of stereotypes that fit in. And whereas those movies can be relatively short, this is a drawn out, drawn out affair due to the nature of its form. Yes. The plot happens in snippets. The plot happens over a long period of time. Because you also have to take into account the fact that he's constantly sending letters and then in certain cases when he receives them, there has to be an account of time has passed between sending and receiving a letter. So bringing back Dracula, <laughs> it's, it's, a similar, <laughs> it's, a, it's a similar story where Dracula is made up of this supplementary literature, except in that case, it's mostly in the form of travelogue by the main character. But again, he's, it's a lot of description. And then he's sort of, he gets closer and closer to the count and the castle and yep. all that sort of stuff. It's also interesting what a lot of time the themes that come across in these stories end up being very similar due to their due to the nature of description being their main force of uh, communication. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of these colonial messages, a lot of descript a lot of talk of the difference between here and there. 
again yeah. taking dracula for example a lot of people when you read dracula there's a very uh reverse colonial message going on where the the old lands are coming back to the motherland and ripping it apart basically and Absolutely. here we ha- again we have a similar sort of thing this colonial land is the the form of the letters being is a, is more a vehicle than anything just to bring about this image of canada yeah yeah like it, it's certainly a form that that allows itself to promote much more personal thoughts than anything mm-hmm. else like yes we can talk we, as we have been right and you pointed out with dracula is we, we can often talk about wider issues of colonialism and womanhood which are very important right mm-hmm. but by and large right the the very form of the epistolary novel is about people's thoughts to one another and observations and observations absolutely if if we bring it back to 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 emily montague for example mm-hmm. right to to me it's kind of interesting how the novel kind of uses the limits of domesticity to break out of them. Right. A lot for a lot of women at the time, as we were and as we were mentioning with Dracula and stuff like that, it's what they know and what the, where they get information is from other people from the outside and writing letters to one another. And this is true with men also, right? You get information mm-hmm. by talking to other people, right, or sending letters to other people. Um, but if we're keeping within, I think it's a much more striking example when we talk about women because they are so psycho uh, both mentally and physically confined to more domestic spheres i think it (laughs) appears more (laughs) but no but it's true right so this this idea of using the form to expand beyond the household right and be able to talk about things that you hear about through uh that you hear about but can't necessarily express out in public but that you can suddenly talk about and develop more ideas with your peers, right? Whether it's through Ed Rivers or Arabella or whatever you want, right? Right. I I think that's a very, uh, I think that's a very good thing that the novel manages to balance is this ability to not only criticize the outside, but also criticize how women themselves use the form of the letters to criticize the outside. (laughs) Do you see what I mean? I don't know if that was that was, that was a bit of a complicated. No, sentence. no, no. It's it's and it's definitely again previous literature that I see in classes. You see the epistolary form is a, often a form used by women for women, mm-hmm. as it fits into the nature of they they cannot go into the public sphere that they cannot turn or travel or adventure. So what is left to them is writing and receiving letters. Yeah, and it's through those letters that they kind of break the feminine mold a bit. But again, they break it for themselves. So that's kind of fascinating. (laughs) Obviously, with a book like The History of Emily Montague, which was quite popular, or even Dracula, right? Which was quite popular. It would have been read by men and women eventually. But by and large, right, if you think of letter writing as a form in and of itself and epistolary novels or novels as a popular form, it sometimes it was just women that read themselves right? <laughs> or, or people from their circles. Mm-hmm. So to, to have a book like The History of Emily Montague, I think is a bit of an exception to the rule, but it's certainly a step in a, is a great step in the right direction of having women being able to express themselves in politics uh, in the politics of Canada, Quebec, things that are typically male in an 18th century European society and still have a popular audience while doing that. I think that's an excellent use of the epistolary form, despite oh, it's, sure. so, it's such its personal uh, outlook. Oh, for sure. The best, the something, when something uses a form correctly, it uses the form to make a commentary almost on the form itself. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for, like, if we take an example, this is letter 45, right? The <laughs> entire uh, or at least a lot of the bottom half of the letter is about is simultaneously like them talking about what the politics of canada are right so for example at the bottom is like the politics of canada are as complex and as difficult to be understood as those of the germanic system i don't know what the germanic system looked like at the time to say that but i'll i'll take francis brooks word for it on this one (laughs) <laughs> For example, in responding, this is your idea of Quebec, my idea is perfectly just. It is like a third or fourth rate country town in England. Much hospitality, little society, cards, scandal, dancing, and good cheer, etc., etc. So, you know, a lot of these are observation, 
in which case, in this case, it's Arabella who makes a lot of these observations, or as she says herself, my father says that the politics are this, but that she's allowed to express them to, in this case, Miss Rivers is really a testament to the ways in which the, those ideas were disseminated. Right. Well, what else did you want to add for the book? We're just going to maybe start shifting the discussion as this, as the first Canadian novel. Yeah, let's go for it. The debate around that statement. Okay, so I guess this would be a good place to start this debate is how would you consider it the first Canadian novel? In what capacity would you consider it to be that? I mean, in a lot of ways, you have to, that leads to the bigger discussion of when does Canada start developing its own canon? Oh, yeah. And we both have thoughts on this one. Okay, go for it. I mean, it's, in the end, I would probably lean towards this being Canadian novel. Mm -hmm. just due to the content i don't necessarily but i definitely see the other side the fact that brooks is not canadian the fact that she was not in canada for a very long time Mm -hmm. and i definitely think if anybody wants to say this wasn't a canadian novel or the first canadian novel i wouldn't disagree with them right or even coming back to the form right the epistolary it it doesn't scream no so yeah go for it no i was just gonna say it also just as a, like as a traditional novel, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you could say that about a lot of about a lot of novels, even up to the one we most recent uh, one of the ones we most recently read with the poems of Joseph Howe, for example. Like, yes, the theme itself was Acadia in this case, like Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. but the form uh, was very much British inspired. It was very British romantic. It was he, he, Joseph Howe himself was while he was born in Nova Scotia, was very much an Anglophile, right? So yep. how would would you consider how to be a Canadian author, right? Well, for sure, that's a fair point to make, you know? There's a lot to be. Again, people much smarter and more well-informed than I probably have that debate all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, especially with Canadian literature, like, as you say, because the country kind of went through and still goes through a great deal of shifts is it fair to say that canadian literature started with confederation i don't think so i agree with you on that i would lean more towards this being a canadian novel i find a lot of time it gets into the heart of what counts and makes canadian canadian okay you know if you take a look at what a lot of a lot of american literature talks about a lot of discussion revolves around freedom Mm mm-hmm because that is what's as important. And then if you take a look at a lot of old British literature, there's a lot of talk about social, social movement, social class, social levels, even going so far back as Shakespeare. Yeah. A lot of Shakespeare happens because of social level classes or classes between social circles. Mm-hmm. All of Romeo and Juliet happens because two families which inhabit these large social circles cannot come to an agreement. Absolutely. And so it gets to the heart of, well what's Canada talking about for its theme? I think a lot of, and this, uh, I don't think it's easy to pinpoint as, I don't think it's as easy to pinpoint a lot of. Um, no, not at all. And I'm not saying it should be. Right. No, 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 exactly. But I, I mean, when you were pointing to freedom in the States or social movements in Britain, even something as broad as those two themes, I think it's a lot harder to talk about with Canada. Maybe it's because I'm so steeped into it that I, <laughs> I just see all kinds of voices for that, but. Oh, I, no, no, like I don't hear as many voices, but I can still see that. And I think yeah. part of it plays into how I'm, I'm using this in big, big, big quotations, but uneventful Canadian right. history <laughs> sort of is. Again, big, 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 big quotations, but like, let's compare rebellions between <laughs> Canada and the mm-hmm. States, shall we? The, those couple episodes we did on the Canadian rebellions that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people, most people didn't even know that there was the rebellions in what was it, Upper or Lower Canada? Both. Yeah. <laughs> Versus the most well-known revolution in history. Mm-hmm. Or like the only one you could make the argument for is the French Revolution. Right. I think if, if we were to ascribe like a theme to Canadian letters, I think a big part of it would be... Or Canadian literature. Or yeah, Canadian literature would be balancing... Yeah, just kind of going off of this balancing freedom and like it's it's balancing the states and Britain in this case, right? Balancing mm-hmm. freedom and social movements. Yeah. Um, these kinds of passive 
passive revolts, I guess, would be like a good way to say it. I think that's a huge part of a lot of our literature, yeah. even though it's not necessarily overtly said. I think a, a great part of Canadian literature is exactly that uh, kind of man versus nature is a huge part of it. And just keeping a lot of these systems that the French, that the British brought up while still developing ourselves as a society. And I would also add on to that, like movement plays a big part. I find a lot of time in Canadian literature, there's constantly this theme of moving to new places, new mm -hmm. frontiers, new territory, new sort of locales, as it were. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, with all of that, I think Emily Mont Montague, while not necessarily deliberately doing it, I think definitely shows a lot of these aspects. Mm -hmm. right? Or even um, there was a critic uh, who was very popular in the 50s and 60s called Northrop Fry, who coined the term for Canadian literature, specifically of the garrison mentality. This idea of representing Canadian society as this kind of garrison, this fort that is either psychologically or very physically fighting against the unknown wilderness, right? Whatever form that may take. Right. And he even specifically points to Emily Montague as an early example of that. So, and that's an idea that carries throughout so much of Canadian literature. Even if you mentioned right before, Margaret Atwood talks a lot about that in novels, for example, like Surfacing. So this, I think a lot of the groundwork is laid here. And mm -hmm. I think a part of that even if it's not deliberate, is purely in the setting in which she's writing. I think there's something about writing in Canada at this time, especially in the colonial period, that brings out this kind of idea, the vastness of it, the uncertainty of it, the already initial mixity of all these populations, whether it's First Nations, the French, and the British, that brings this kind of quiet shift or sometimes very violent shift that permeates through literature up until today, I would argue. Right. Well, it's like, again, Canada's still, we're still having to figure out where our identity is. Canadian identity is always going to be a discussion, you know, because we're also a country that's big on people, like, keeping their own cultural identity. Yeah. Especially today's, nowadays, you know, a big part of Canada is about respecting cultural identity of, of all these different groups. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to then find one Canadian identity. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I have, like, a series of questions that I guess, like, that I just wrote down. Do it. We've already been talking for like 75 minutes, so we anyway. might not go through all of them, but just to kind of cap off the episode and kind of conclude a lot of these thoughts that we've just thrown out there about Emily Montague. <laughs> so we, we've mentioned Francis Brooke as an early example of feminism, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to express these complex ideas about domesticity and womanhood in 18th century uh, Europe and 18th century Canada. <sighs> Would you consider this novel as, I, I wrote down a novel of protest, but I, I don't think it's necessarily the right word because she's no. not actively going out and protesting, but. Uh, that, that, that gets, that's more debate of what you call a protest at that point. Yes, obviously. But do you, do you, do you see what I mean? This idea, do you a think novel for change. novel of, yeah, exactly. I think would, it is. Yeah. I think, I think there's, again, there's any, almost I'd say with most travel and colonial writings there's gonna be a point of it that's about change about the new because that's what you're doing when you travel mm -hmm. if you want things to stay the same you'd stay at home <laughs> right <laughs> to put it very bluntly <laughs> yeah no you're right mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess kind of going off of that this is kind of a softball question but i think going off of that do you think there's something about the the settler experience that allows for this kind of mentality of change to bring put forth to, to be put yes. forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, again, it's whenever there's something new or unexplored, there's always a chance for opportunity, you know, an opportunity always creates change. Mm -hmm. So I think any represent, any proper representation of the settler experience is going to portray that opportunity that lands there you know and just the ideals of the new world as it was known you know always spoke to that sort of change and birth of new ideas i guess yeah but it's kind of interesting that those ideas of change would so quickly solidify 
because like it's just going back to the pictures that we were putting right uh, up at the beginning one of them of a settler woman and one of them of francis brooke right ostensibly uh sarah solomon came over for this idea of change a new life a better life uh which is what a lot of settlers came here for or just to conquer to to, to conquer and take land right whatever you want to do it's like a form of change. Uh, glory and gold right but it, it all of these are in a sense a form of change uh-huh. and but very quickly right you see images of women like sarah solomon representing a very specific moment in time right that change very quickly stopped whereas ironically the european woman in francis brooke coming to north america this place that was supposed to escape the stagnation of <laughs> of europe is this force of change right it's kind of like a circle of change and lack thereof that i think is very interesting <laughs> now last question i guess do you think that that there, there's a few articles that i read here about this is that do you think that this is a positive view of the potential of canada from no. what you've read no i okay it, it's 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 very much a positive view of colonies and the mother country and how the much the mother country is important to colonies but i don't think this is a positive view of the colony itself it's a positive view of the relationship you know of the relationship of this guiding hand of the motherland yeah uh i'll take a bit of a mixed stance on this one just because like I, I i think i can talk a bit more about this because i've read a bit more of the book than you have no for sure but throughout the book she does point to these ideas of the potential of change right so for example the ideas of uh companionate marriage that she talks about in the old maid some of it does come up in the novel right this mm-hmm. idea right emily montague spoiler does end up being engaged to ed rivers right so there is very much ingrained into the story of the text this idea that you know you go against what in this case emily montague's father wanted in uh, her to marry uh, i forget the name of the character she was supposed to marry and marry for love instead right marry for right. the person that you want even though ed rivers is a giant douche but <laughs> and there, there's all kinds of ways in which she she does it in the book but i think it does offer the seeds of newness and potential for the colony but i think it lacks a lot of grounded and very specific ideas and how it can do that and so i'm gonna just end up on a mixed uh, i'm gonna be on the fence on this one i think if she had pushed a lot of these ideas that she mentions a bit further <laughs> then i would have said yes right but as it stands meh i can get behind that i feel that's fair all right was there anything that you wanted to mention as a last thought or I'm trying to remember if we talked about anything in the pre-show that we didn't mention here i think the most salient fact was dracula <laughs> oh dracula oh i love you dracula never change you know what no i'm gonna end on a last question oh yay and this is kind of an audience question oh thank god for those of you if you want to if you've read it or if you do want a reader based off of the discussion that we've had today about the history of emily montague would you consider this a canadian novel right see i'm doing this call to action thing that we're supposed to do and when we're right. talking in social media but like right. i just yeah no i was just thinking the same thing it's like oh yeah that thing we're supposed to do to try and get people to like <laughs> interact and promote our show no we're, we make jokes and all but based we're off of here what for the we were views. talking about no based off of what we were talking about would listeners consider this a canadian novel we both lean on yes but there's a very solid argument to say no but yeah we're gonna leave it at that i guess we'll just end with saying thank you to everyone for listening you can reach out with questions comments concerns anything you want through the facebook page through twitter by email we've been getting some good responses lately keep them coming or as always you can leave a review on itunes it helps boost the show yep. and as we mentioned at the top of the episode there are a bunch of ways that you can support us you can give a one-time donation through paypal you can check out our recommended reading page and buy through the affiliate links you can check out most importantly 
Patreon, which has our sister show, Pop Canada, which Woo-woo. is entirely run by Mackenzie. Why don't you tell us a bit about it, Mac? I don't know. I just got this idea of like, we're talking about the past of Canada and we're going to be there for a while. So I thought, why not talk about the present of Canada and how much pop culture in Canada has seeped internationally throughout the world, you know, through such topics such as like Cirque du Soleil, uh, Michael Bublé. Oh, yeah. Other topics that don't sound French. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. Michael Bublé's from Vancouver. It's fine. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> right now, our only other topic we did was Denis Villeneuve. That was a good episode. I really liked that one. That was fun. So anyway, all of this is ways in which you can support us, and they would be greatly appreciated. But as always, times are tough. It's fine. You can just listen to the free show. And once things pick up, support us then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For now, we'll just wish you all excellent health. And we'll see you again in two weeks' time. With Woo-woo. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.